Hi, Luminitza, and welcome Hello. to my podcast. Hello. Thank you for having me, and thank you that you invited me. It was really, really unexpected and nice. Oh, I'm glad uh, that we can have this chat because I really admire what you do. And I want to say thank you as well for listening to my podcast because I know you listen to it. And yes. a big, big thank you <laughs> <laughs> from I'm a big my fan. Part. Oh, oh. <laughs> Thank you so much. Do you know what? I was listening to your video about self-confidence and I learned how to take a compliment. So I'm going to take this compliment oh. and say, thank you so much, Luminita. <laughs> I think this is the biggest compliment that you can give, let's say, a creator. Um, when you say that, oh, I learned that and you see that your, um, I don't know, texts or your videos have an impact on people and people not just listen or watch, but they really learn something. It's, it's amazing. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I love so much that you do your videos, very informative. And I have been watching quite a few. I, I learned a lot of useful tips and things that I recognize, like situations that I rec recognize myself in. And I just think, oh, yeah, because sometimes you do these things and you don't actually think it through and you don't realize you do it. And then even the simplest thing about saying thank you to a compliment, the way that you are explaining it, it's so true that sometimes we're trying to diminish the compliment by saying, oh no, but you know, I just got lucky or oh no, 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 you know, trying to be extra modest when you can just, just take the compliment, just say thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. You made my day and then, um, you know, pay compliments to other people if they are sinc sincere, obviously. But it's such... I don't know. It's just like you realize, oh, yeah, actually, that is so true. <laughs> you pay extra thought to it. So it's amazing. Thank you for doing this video. <laughs> okay, thank let me you for the compliment. <laughs> oh, we're going to keep saying thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's cool. Um, I, I like it that we already started with a lot of laughter. And that's how I think the whole episode is going to be. A lot of positivity and laughter and a lot of knowledge and information. But let's start um, from the part where you decided to move to Austria. Do you want to tell me why Austria? How did you get there? What are you studying? Uh, so I was born and raised, uh, raised in Moldova and Chisinau. Um, and I, I love my country. But uh, because I lived my whole life till 18, my, to my almost 19th birthday, uh, in the same apartment, so we never moved, mm -hmm. I somehow had the feeling that I want to see something else and try something else out. And um, as unfortunately many um, kids in Moldova, in high school, I decided that I don't want to go to university in Moldova because either the system is corrupted or the quality is not that good. So yeah, I decided to go to, I, I wanted to go to Europe or European Union. And um, my, I have a sister, she's nine years older, or if you ask her, she will say she's eight years and 10 months old. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she moved to Austria, uh, I think more than 10 years ago, also mm -hmm. after high school. Mm -hmm. And I visited her a couple of times and now I, I fell in love with Innsbruck. Um, if, you ever, if you've ever been in Innsbruck in Austria, you know what I'm talking about. If you've never ever been here, really Google it and you will see it's, it's right in the middle of the mountains. It's surrounded by the mountains. So no matter where you, what, where you look, you'll see mountains. And um, all the houses in the old town, old, old town they're like... Um, this um, cookies for, for Christmas, uh, gingerbread uh, houses. So really, really Aww. cute. Aww. So I saw that and I, I, I decided that I want to, to leave here as well. So I started to, to, I think in the 11th grade in high school, I started to learn German so that I'm prepared. And uh, right after I got the grades from my uh, like A levels, I, I moved to Austria, very confident very passionate, uh, very happy that now I'm uh, strong and independent and far away from home. So now <laughs> I'm very grown up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, uh, yeah. I know this feeling, uh, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's such uh, an interesting feeling because on the one hand side, at least in my case, I set so such high expectations from this experience. I had somehow I, I was maybe I didn't have this feeling, but I was expecting to have this feeling as if it's a new chapter of my life and everything is different and I'm a different person and now I don't live with my parents anymore. That means that I'm very adult and mm-hmm. um, I started to work straight away. Oh, I, I took a gap year. Mm-hmm. Uh, so when all my classmates went to university, I went to work because I wanted to learn the language better mm-hmm. and I wanted to financially independent. Um, first because of this uh, grown-up feeling <laughs> and second <laughs> because uh, well, my parents were living and working in Moldova and um, well they the, the, the payment system or the, the wages in Moldova are not that high uh, and Innsbruck is very expensive. Innsbruck fun fact is more expensive than Vienna um, and yeah I, I was uh, I, I wanted to be grown up and I wanted to support my parents and uh, uh, yeah, started to work. That's and that's a great idea. I think um, in the UK as well. For example, even my boyfriend, he took um, a gap year, or I think even more, because he started an apprenticeship straight after school, or mm-hmm. A levels, whatever they do here. Because I'm confused <laughs> with the whole thing. Um, so I think it's one good that you can earn some money. Uh, you can get work experience, but also it gives you time to decide what you want to study in, in university. Because sometimes yeah. I think you just get confused. You just finish school. You have to suddenly decide what you want to do with your life, what you want to study. So it, it just gives you a little bit of experience. And also you have time to decide what you actually like, what you want to study. Yeah. And then he went on later and did, I think he went uh, when he was 23 to study at university. And yeah. in between that, he worked he traveled and then he thought oh yeah now i know actually what i want to study and he really Mm -hmm. put all his efforts in that and he was financially independent as well as you were saying so it's a great idea yeah and i think this idea of gap year is much more popular in european union or america Mm -hmm. um i think now it gets a little bit more popular in eastern europe as well but um four years ago it wasn't or five years ago Mm-hmm. So I remember um, it was the last high school year. And of course, all the teachers were asking us what we are going to do. And when I was telling my teachers and the majority of the teachers in my school were older, they were from Soviet Union, so mm-hmm. to say. Mm-hmm. And when I was telling them that I want to take a year, like a gap year, or not study for a year, they were all shocked. And they were asking me, what did your parents say? Mm-hmm. Are you sure? Do, do your parents know about that? What, what is their opinion? And uh, I, of course, my parents knew about that. And when I told them that I want to take a gap year, I told them why I want to do that and what I'm going to do in this year. It's not that, oh, I don't want to study anymore. It yeah. was more for, yeah, I want to start to work a little bit and see how it is to work because I, I was a child till now mm-hmm. and I want to, I don't know, get my experience. And I really don't regret this gap year at all because when I started my university, I didn't have this pressure of working while studying mm-hmm. because at some point, a lot of my um, university mates um, decided to work because they wanted to, I don't know, go partying more and their parents would not give them extra money for that. Yeah. Or, uh, I don't know, they wanted to buy something new and they had to work for that. And I already did that before, so I didn't have this pressure. So I could just concentrate my studies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't regret that at all. So what do you study in? What language do you study in? I study in English. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm doing my bachelor's in business and management. Mm-hmm. That's super cool. In the last year. Last year? Yeah. Okay, so you have to write a dissertation now. Yeah, it's like now, this semester, I'm still studying. I, I actually, <laughs> right now I'm in Innsbruck, but um, I should have been in Madrid, in Spain, 
for mm -hmm. my exchange semester, but oh. because of um, Corona and um, yeah, the situation in Spain, the university in Madrid decided that it was not the best idea for us to go there. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm, uh, I, yeah. I'm glad to actually to be able to enjoy this view of the mountains for one more semester. But then, uh, um, according to my study program, uh, the last semester is the bachelor thesis and the internship. So in the next semester, I have to do my internship full time and write my bachelor thesis. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to quickly say that while you were saying about the gingerbread biscuits, I did search for Innsbruck <laughs> Christmas time. And I think uh, it's amazing that you can spend the sem semester in there because Christmas looks wonderful in there. Yes, All this light, yeah. I know probably there'll be some restrictions, but I imagine the decorations will still be there. Yeah, and you know, you walk, uh, especially in the evening, you walk in the old town or, or old town or the center and you can really smell everywhere glühwein and all the pastries and there's Christmas music. There is sometimes even a little orchestra that is performing live, some um, Christmas songs. So it's really wonderful. It's it's kind of part of a fairy. Like it, it feels as if you are in in a fairy tale. It's really wonderful. Aww. it sounds wonderful, and I really want to be there for Christmas now. One year, <laughs> I don't know when, but it's really really gorgeous. <laughs> so, what what else do you like about Austria in, ge in general? What um, changed you in a way? Uh, was it the mentality also the beauty but what what did Austria bring into your life I don't know if this question makes sense it's just like hey what uh, I don't know if I don't even know how to ask this question how did you change after moving to Austria I guess I don't know uh, I think it changed me a lot but I think it was it was really a process so when I moved from Moldova to Austria um somehow my surviving instinct uh, was uh, switched on and uh, I somehow decided that I can integrate into this society uh, where if I become like them. Mm -hmm. So um, in Austria, well, they speak German, but uh, in the whole Austria, they have many, many different dialects. Mm -hmm. So the way they speak here in Innsbruck is very differently, different from the way they speak, like Austrians speak in Vienna, for example. Mm -hmm. And um, my goal number one was to really learn the dialect and speak in the dialect, somehow dress up like them, um, get similar interests like the locals. So I really wanted to look like and sound like a local because I had this feeling that this way I can integrate much easier and faster. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing is that the culture in Western Europe, especially in a mountain region and Innsbruck, um, I cannot say that they are, their mentality is closed because it's not true, but it's somehow it's very, very different from Eastern Europe, mm -hmm. European um, mentality. Mm -hmm. So when I transform myself somehow in a local, I realized that, okay, now I'm very similar to them, but I don't feel good because it's not the way I am. <laughs> um, so I think like after two years, um, I realized that I want to change back, but you cannot just go back to who you've been two years ago. So now I, now I think I mastered already uh, this balance between Eastern European culture and Western European culture. I somehow tried to take the best out of these two worlds. Yeah. And uh, combine it in such a way that is comfortable for me. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think, uh, so for example, yeah, see. In, in, in the clothing style, mm -hmm. um, in Eastern Europe, although now it's different, and now it's not that much but when I lived in Moldova I remember that the girls in Kishino when they were walking on the street it was like a catwalk mm -hmm. all the girls were wearing high heels or the majority were wearing high heels mm -hmm. and they had makeup and they were I don't know dressed up very specially 
mm-hmm. um, in Innsbruck because it's a very uh, sports-oriented city. Everyone wear, or the majority wear sneakers and mm-hmm. they're wearing sports clothes all the time because they'll go to the training in two hours anyway. Mm-hmm. And I realized that um, for me personally, the best is a combination of. So I still enjoy wearing dresses and nice skirts and I like to look nice and from my perspective, nice. But at the same time, I don't want to go to an extreme of wearing just high heels or just sneakers. So I somehow try to combine these two. Yeah, I know uh, what you mean. Uh, I think that's the thing with moving to a different country with a different mentality. So when I go back to Moldova, I don't feel Moldovan. Yeah. But when I come back to the UK, I don't feel British. So I just like, I'm somewhere in between. And yeah. I pick and choose what I like. That's the great thing about it. You kind of, I kind of feel that I'm out in the air. I don't integrate anywhere <laughs> because I'm trying, as you're saying, I was trying to assimilate as much as I could from British culture, for example. And, yeah. but then some things, it's, it's like my boyfriend says, you can take the girl out of Moldova, but you can't take Moldova yeah. out of the girl. <laughs> some things. <That's> true. <laughs> <laughs> some things are still <laughs> some things that I do or say are still quite Moldovan, you know. But then again, when I go back to Moldova, I'm just thinking like, why do people act this way? Why do people think this way? Yeah. I don't feel Moldovan in here. <laughs> That's true. And I, I, the first time I had this feeling was when I um, visited. I, 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 go, I went back to Moldova just for I think one month, no, one week, and um, in Austria. When you uh, enter, um, I don't know, a bus, Mm -hmm. if you enter it on like, not not in the front where the the driver is, you always say hello to the driver. Yeah. And if you exit the bus from the front door, you'll always say bye to the driver. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I was in Kishinau in a trolley bus. Yeah. Uh, And um, if there is someone who who was never in Moldova in the trolley bus, there is a special lady or a man uh, who goes through the trolley bus. It's basically like a bus, but electric. Uh, and you pay this person. So you give, give this person cash and this person will take a piece of paper and give it to you. Very interesting system. So um, when I was in Kishinev, there was this woman that I had to pay. And she approached me and I said, hello. And she looked at me and she was like, why are you talking to me? <laughs> do we know each other i was like sorry (laughs) the the whole trolley bus was staring at me like what's wrong with this super nice girl (laughs) oh my god so i had a little bit of the opposite thing i do like saying hello to everyone i mean i really like waving and saying hello and being friendly to people and i was Mm -hmm. like that before as well but then when i first came to the UK and then somebody at the, at the till in the supermarket um, said, you're right, love. And I'm thinking, you don't know me. Why are you calling me love? I'm not your love. <laughs> I had a similar feeling uh, when I was in India. My boyfriend and I, uh, we, were, um, we went to New Delhi. Um, and over there, they're extra nice. So they would call you friend all the time. So Aww. what do you want, friend? what uh, or a sister or friend and for me it was a little bit too much like why do you call me friend we don't know each other yeah, like, yeah. he said everything fine friend i was like we're not friends but of course i would not say that but yeah. it's this you really have to adjust to the culture or the place you are yeah and it's, it's just a way of them just treating you nicely but i did yeah. get this kind of a little bit of a shock i'm like what <laughs> i'm not your love <laughs> <laughs> like you're saying, I'm not your friend. Then how how do you how do you call people that are actually your friends? Everyone is your friend, basically. Maybe yeah. you just say best friend. You're my best friend. You're just my friend. <laughs> you're a little bit my best. You're my second best friend. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. So talking about travels, because you're just saying about um, traveling to India, you like traveling in general. 
Tell me a little bit I... about yeah your experience with travel in Europe and outside as well. I mean, it's a very broad question. Yeah. <laughs> you pick and choose what you want to talk about. <laughs> um, I love traveling, but um, for me, it's kind of a um, possibility to, let's say, relax. Because um, in Innsbruck, as I said, is surrounded by mountains, which is amazingly beautiful. But because I come from Moldova, where there were there are no mountains, um, for me it's sometimes, I, so sometimes I get this feeling that I'm close, that I cannot see the horizon, uh, mm -hmm. that I'm somehow locked somewhere. So for me, traveling is a little bit of a, um, taking a, um, a breath, a fresh, uh, sort of like going somewhere where I can see new things and new people and new buildings. Mm -hmm. And um, I traveled kind of quite a lot in Europe, but uh, I was almost, I, I traveled with my best friends. So this is one type of traveling for me. Mm -hmm. um, one of my best friends still lives in Moldova, in Chisinau, and the other one lives in um, UK. And uh, one kind of travel is, for us, is when we make a reunion somewhere. Mm -hmm. So we meet all together in Italy, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and this is one kind of travel for me. The other type of travel for me is when I travel all alone. This is when I take uh, a little bag with almost no things inside and I go alone by train somewhere for two days. Mm -hmm. And this is how I traveled a lot in Europe. For example, I was this way in Prague, in um, Slovakia, Slovenia, um, I was in Amsterdam, so I was really a lot in Europe this way, just to see different people all by myself, and I also realized that when I was traveling alone, the chances that I would get to know more people, or new people, was higher, because I was all alone, and um, maybe you can hear, but I'm very talkative, <laughs> so I need to talk to someone. <laughs> I love it. I'm talkative. Too, so. <laughs> but this was one of the reasons why I uh, started to get to know new people because I would like to talk to someone. Yeah. Um, That's the reason. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, by the way, um, I, I did listen to your episode about interrupting and I hope it's, <laughs> it's the type of the <laughs> interrupting that is the good one. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, wait, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> I interrupted my own thought. It's okay. Oh my God. Oh my God. I don't know what I was going to say. But anyway, uh -huh. I, I just want to concentrate uh, to talk a little bit more about the fact that you're traveling by yourself, which is such a good thing to talk about because a lot of girls, ladies in special, they just have the fear of traveling by themselves. And I did a podcast uh, with a Moldovan girl, by the way, who traveled around the world by herself. And I mm -hmm. find this just such a cool thing to do because I did this myself. I went to Paris for the first time by myself because I, I like to be kind of independent and, and I love traveling. Mm -hmm. And yeah, if I could travel with my friends, I will. If I like, I do the same thing that you say, I meet, especially with my sister, we meet in, in a different country we try mm -hmm. every time to meet in a different country so that we can see each other, but also we can visit new places. So that's a cool way of traveling. But also, if you really want to see a place, you don't actually have to wait for someone to come with you. You can just go and just do it. And, and then you meet actually, as you're saying, more friendly people than you think. And risks are anywhere. You don't have to fear to have this fear of traveling by yourself. So I think this is such an important subject to talk about. So please keep talking about it. <laughs> I think I started to uh, travel by myself out of, I don't know, let's say need, because I wanted to travel. But um, from my personal experience, you, I, I would rather travel alone mm -hmm. than with a travel buddy that doesn't match my traveling style. Yeah. Because... Um, for example, when I um, go to, let's say, I don't know, Prague, uh, I, want to, I want to walk 
in the city. I want to feel the city. I can, of course, um, take the bus if it's very far away. And I, otherwise, I cannot go there. But I like to walk there. I spend the whole day outside. Um, I like to discover the cuisine, but it's more of um, a thing that I do while walking. Uh, and I once, I was once traveling with a person, amazing person, super nice, but our traveling styles were not matching. Mm -hmm. So this person would rather stay at home and uh, watch the, the TV in the other language or go outside only in the evening to see the nightlife. And this is not bad. It is just very different from the way I travel. Yeah. And in this situation, either I stay at home because of this person and I don't enjoy uh, discovering the city or I have to force the, this person to come with me, which is also not uh, an option. Mm -hmm. That's why um, I think I started to travel alone because um, I, would not, I, I could not find too many people who are the same way I am. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, I told you one of my best friends still lives in Kishino and uh, we realized that our traveling styles match 100%. So when we were together in uh, Barcelona in Spain, uh, it was such an amazing experience because I didn't have to force her to walk with me and she didn't have to force me to walk with her. We would just wake up in the morning, have a coffee and just go somewhere. And mm -hmm. um, I think it's brilliant. But uh, to the topic that you said that it's, uh, it can be dangerous to uh, travel alone. Um, well, I, I was not in places that are super dangerous. So I was trying to travel in more capitals mm -hmm. or bigger cities. But even there, I think as long as you have a head on your shoulders and you can see the situation like if you see a street that has absolutely no lights and you have an alternative to go to take another street you take the other street so you, although you travel i think when you travel alone you have to be more cautious that's true you don't relax at 100 percent in this sense but as long as you can observe the situation and if someone talks to you if you can somehow see, is this person dangerous? Is this person trying to sell me something? Is this tr person trying to steal from me? If you try to be a little bit more cautious, um, of course, there are always some bad situations, but then you minimize them. Mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's amazing. I really agree with everything that you say. And um, what was I going to say about walking? Because we, do, we start talking a little bit about walking tours because me, me and my boyfriend, mm -hmm. when we visit the city, we really want like to do a walking tour. So the concept is, I'll quickly explain for those who don't know, uh, is that you go with uh, a guide that they um, walk you through the city probably for two hours or three hours. And, and then, you know, you just stop at certain points and then they tell you r really interesting things about either the building or the actual place or I don't know they just find really interesting stories to tell you about the city but in the same time you actually walk and uh, you know after that it's just amazing to just stop at, and have a hearty meal but you you felt like you've actually seen the city so I was actually very impressed to learn that you were one of these guides that do this yes. tours <laughs> <laughs> do, so let's start First, tell me if you do um, go to these kind of tours when you do these travels. And second of all, if you want to tell me a little bit about your experience as a guide. Uh, yes, I also prefer to take um, free walking tours uh, when I travel because um, I think, um, at least from my experience, I don't want to make anyone feel bad, but from my experience, I have the feeling that the tour guides from these free walking tours, they give you a lot of information, but it's not too much information. So they would stop to a building and tell you something, but they will not take the whole history book and read from it or tell you that. So you kind of remember things, but your head doesn't hurt afterwards. Your legs might. <laughs> <laughs> <Definitely>. <laughs> 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 but... Um, I think it's it's a very interesting mix of 
you are still with a guide, but at the same time, because you're working with strangers who are also tourists, you can talk to someone. And I got to know a lot of people during these walking tours because on the way to the next destination, I would talk to someone next to me and find out where this person comes from mm -hmm. and uh, that he or she's traveling alone or is visiting someone and so on and so forth. So I think it's an amazing combination of meeting new people, learning the city, walking in the city. And um, what I also like is that uh, that's why it's called free walking tour. So there's, you don't have to pay, mm -hmm. but you can give a tip yeah. in the end. And I think it's very good for people that are traveling um, um, with a certain budget. budget. Yeah. Yeah. Because then you can decide what, how, how much worth it was. Was it, I don't know, five year, years worth, 20, 50, two years worth, or how much you can afford to pay. Mm -hmm. And if... But let's say everyone is putting five euros and you put only two euros because you don't have more. Nobody will look at you in a bad way and tell you that you're a bad person. No, because it's a tip base. Mm -hmm. And I really enjoy it. Um, to my experience as uh, a guide, the first time I heard about free walking tours was in Kishina when I was living in Kishina. Um, I was very active in Kishinev, so I was in, I think, almost all the projects possible. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and um, there was one project, um, I don't remember the name, but it was about learning English, but in a different way. Um, anyway, so I was at this project because it was free of charge, it was interesting, and yeah, it, I was there. <laughs> and mm -hmm. at some point... Um, one of the organizers heard that my English is pretty good. And they asked me if I would, have, I would be interested in giving tours in Kishinev. Mm -hmm. And of course, new opportunity, new project, I'm all in. <laughs> um, and um, I think, I might be wrong, but I think I was the second free tour guide in Kishinev. Not the first, but I think the second, maybe the third, but I guess the second. Mm -hmm. um, in the history of the uh, walking tour, in case you know. Um, and I would get uh, information from the organizers about the city. I could, of course, learn something additionally, or I personally was telling a lot of stories from my experience because I was born and raised in Kishinev, so I could tell historical things, but also things from my life that happened there or there. Mm -hmm. um, and it was amazing because um, uh, I think because tourism in Moldova is not that developed, mm -hmm. for me, it was a big opportunity to be a tour guide because then I could meet people from different countries mm -hmm. and I could practice my English, like my speaking English. And uh, it was an honor for me to present them the city that I was born in. And uh, I know that a lot of people, when they come to Eastern Europe, they have a lot of stereotypes that, I don't know, the buildings are ugly from Soviet Union or that is bad or whatever. And for me, it was really an honor to show them that the city can be different, that the city can be beautiful, the city can have uh, a very interesting and bright history. So yeah, that was, uh, that was really cool. But then I had to, uh, when I moved to Austria, obviously I was not a tour guide there anymore. Yet two years later, I realized that, hmm, I, I miss this day. I miss those days. And um, I searched for free tour in Innsbruck mm -hmm. and there was none. Really? Yes. <laughs> Oh. And then a brilliant idea <laughs> came to my mind. <laughs> There's an opportunity. <laughs> yes, there is, a, there is a place in the market. <laughs> so uh, I, uh, yeah, I opened Future Innsbruck. And I was, really? Uh, found, yeah. Oh my God, and that's was, so amazing. <laughs> yeah, so the second um, one in, Mo in Moldova or in Kishinev, but I imagine in Moldova, not places you yeah. can't really find them. <laughs> and the first one in Innsbruck. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, tell me more about it. Uh, so yeah, I was the founder and the guide, but then um, and everything was pretty, like, it, it was super interesting. I mean, I don't come from Innsbruck, but I learned a lot about its history. 
And because I was living there, again, I could tell some stories. So I kind of took my uh, guiding style to Innsbruck as well. But then um, the thing in Innsbruck, um, or in, I guess in Tyrol, there is a different law when it comes to tourism. Mm -hmm. So um, free tour Innsbruck or my free tour Innsbruck was very in a gray zone. Because on one hand side, um, Innsbruck is a very touristy city, very. So there are a lot of tourists here. I mean, now because of um, pandemics, not so much, but generally a lot. And uh, a free walking tour would be a very, very big threat to the other paid tourist guides. Yeah. And uh, because it's cheaper, it's more fun and so on. And because the tourism is so strong in Innsbruck, of course, they would not let anyone enter the market. Mm -hmm. And um, That's a shame. No competition. Yes. Yeah, I mean, they, they have competition with themselves, mm -hmm. but not with someone new. Yeah. And um, I heard from a couple of people that I could open, uh, that they, they tried already to start a free tour uh, in Innsbruck, but they couldn't get the license. Mm -hmm. And I would eventually need a license too. I don't know if, if it was true or not if they were just lying to me or not, but um, um, I didn't want to go in, in, into anything illegal here. Yeah. Uh, and um, I also started to, I started my bachelor program and it is full time. So I got less and less time and um, I didn't have enough time to not just be a guide, but to um, think of a license and get into all this legal stuff and so on. So unfortunately, I had to give up on this idea. Maybe one day I come back to it. Yeah. But uh, for now, unfortunately, I had to um, give up on this idea. Mm. Yeah, I was going to say the reason why we really like them is because, as you're saying, they are more fun. As for example, we went to Bucharest and uh, we did a free walking tour. And then we did a tour that uh, was prepaid for at the Casa Poporlui. Mm -hmm. And it just seems like when you, when you are already paying a ticket and the guides in there, they don't seem to... I mean, of course, I can't generalize, but the, the, that particular guide was really not motivated and uninterested mm -hmm. in anything. It, it just seems yeah. so boring. The way that they're just talking, they're probably just repeating the same stuff every day. And they just seemed very bored. <laughs> and we yeah. found it a bit, oh yeah, they don't seem too motivated. But uh, on the other hand, with the free walking tours, because they are tip-based, people really try to put all their energy into it, all the excitement, all, you know, like even the way that they talk. Uh, we even, when we went to Oxford and did a free walking tour, there was a guy that act actually studied acting and he was like wow. really getting into it and his <laughs> character and how because uh, also touching what you talk in your videos about the uh, communication that it can be you know through gestures and the way you yes. talk and uh, the voice that they use and they make they put all this effort to make it really really exciting and they yeah a lot of effort into it and they make a joke and you know they t tell you an interesting intriguing story and they really try to capture your, your attention because at the end they know that their effort is directly proportional to how good they performed also it, it is of course as you say depending on people's budget but if you make it more interesting people will be tempted to give you more money in, in a sense yeah so. Um, that's yeah, true. that's why we like it. Do you, do you want to tell us one thing about Innsbruck? If you if you know it on the top of your head and you you want to tell us something. Oh, there is a very interesting thing, but I don't want to spoil it. So. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you'll just we'll just have to wait until you get your license and then come and visit Innsbruck and do your free walking tour. Yes, we'll find yes. out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. I'll ask you something else then. Is coffee culture as big as in Vienna? Um, yes and no. So in Innsbruck, 
there are many coffee shops, but there are, I guess, three or four that are almost exactly as in back in times, like in Vienna, with the um, style and the design inside. So there are, I think, two, three or four coffee shops in Innsbruck that they are, uh, they have this vibe. Um, but um, I don't know. I think in Innsbruck, it's, it's not as in Italy, for example. So people not drink their espresso in the morning or drink it at the bar. Mm-hmm. But they also don't have this big culture of big lattes with hazelnut and uh, spark- sparkling things and so on. So people just drink their coffee. They meet for coffee. Uh, but it's something in the meal. So it's not just espresso, but it's also not a fancy way of drinking coffee. Okay, Luminita, I think it's time to actually talk about your YouTube channel because uh, this is how, I can't remember actually how I got to know you, but th- that's the first thing I knew y- you about. So connected <laughs> about your YouTube channel. Do you want to tell us how did you get into this? Uh, how did the idea come from? Why did you open this YouTube channel? And what do you think, what do you want to accomplish with it? Ah, oh, that's uh, that's my favorite topic. <laughs> uh, it's it's a long story. So um, We've got I time. first <laughs> um, I first got to know about YouTube. I guess in two thousand nine, two thousand ten. Uh, it was uh, very very new, at least for the eastern part. I'm sure in America it was already popular, but. In Russia, Eastern Europe, um, YouTube was something very new and special. And um, I remember discovering a very popular Russian YouTuber. And I thought, hmm, I want to do the same. So um, my parents had a camera and I, I took it and I started to film. Um, I, I, there were kind of sketches, like something funny, I remember. Um, and I'm not sure if it was in Romanian or, Ru- or Russian, definitely not English. Um, and I actually had already two videos online and I was super proud of them. I also started to search for um, some editing tools and yeah, it was, you imagine it was all 10 years ago. And um, I remember I was super proud of it and I even showed my mom and she said that, oh, it looks cool. So she was supporting me in that. But then uh, two guys from my class uh, found out about my YouTube channel. Mm-hmm. And they started to laugh at me. That, oh my God, look at her. She's doing videos for YouTube. She thinks she will be popular. You know, kids, when they're 11, they can be bullying super alert, mean. Bullying <laughs> Yes. And I, was, I switched my school back then. And it was a new class. And one of the guys that were talking like this, I actually had a crush on him. So his opinion was extremely important for me back then. Um, and they then they started to show everyone around. And now, after years, I know that this is no, you know, like word, word of mouth, it's good promotion. But back then, I was feeling super insecure because everyone was laughing. And... Um, um, I'm not sure if they were laughing because the videos were funny or because they're laughing at me, whatever. Um, yeah, so because I didn't want to feel this bad, I deleted everything. And um, I was living all these 10 years with this thought, what would have been if I had this channel even now? Um, that I still, although I deleted everything, I still had this feeling that I want to do this, that it's interesting for me. And um, I, every single time when I wanted to start a YouTube channel, um, I would think, oh my God, who would watch it? Like, nobody knows me. I'm not an Instagram influencer. So who cares? And so on and so forth. And uh, now, uh, <laughs> uh, and during the lockdown, <laughs> um, I was at home because, uh, yeah, it was lockdown. And I thought that, well, I'm at home anyways. Mm-hmm. Uh, and my boyfriend has a very good camera. He's a um, photographer and he um, makes videos. So I was like, okay, 
I have a good camera, I have time, uh, I want to do that. And um, I started to think what I'm into and I love dancing actually. So the first idea was to make a dancing channel, but then I, I don't know why, I, I actually have a video uh, that I actually filmed and edited, but it's not on my YouTube channel because um, the day I wanted to publish it, I realized that, hmm, I don't know if I really want to go this direction. Mm -hmm. So I filmed another video uh, about my second passion and it's public speaking. Um, and yeah, this is my very first video is about the difference between public speaking and storytelling. And I was, it was the very first video that I edited myself. So my boyfriend introduced me to Premiere Pro, but um, I edited myself and it was just my product, like my little baby. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I posted it and um, with YouTube, when you start a new channel, uh, it boosts you a lot. So on my very first video, I have over 400 views because they boost you very, very much. So you and to keep going, yeah? Exactly. And I didn't know that. No, I did not know that about that. Me neither. So, yeah, me neither. And I was like, oh my God, my, my videos are so interesting for everyone. <laughs> I have to continue. Uh, so it works. Their, their strategy works. Oh. And... Um, my very first video, it's without any microphone. So the sound is not that good. And you know, I, when I sometimes watch this first video because it's not bad, but I like to see where it all started and the whole evolution of me, of the topics of my channel. And uh, now my channel, um, oh, I love it. I, I, because it's a place where I can show my creativity because I changed the styles of the thumbnails, uh, the styles of the channel banner, um, the way I was writing the title. So it's like a play field for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I really enjoy doing it all. So now my channel is uh, actually all about communication. So everything from storytelling, public speaking, presentation styles, presentation tools, but also day-to-day -day communication, as you said, uh, I have some videos about interrupting, about small talking, um, like all around this topic. Also, um, I'm very interested in psychology and mainly in um, communication, like in psychology, communication psychology. So uh, there are some videos for Reverse people. Psychology. I watched Sorry? it today. Reverse psychology or something. Like yeah. That. How to say yeah. no. Oh my God, I love yeah. that video. <laughs> <laughs> but I think these are, okay, public speaking, I still think it's a topic for everyone, but not everyone is having big presentations. Mm -hmm. But all of us talk. Yeah. Or we listen. And we talk with words, by writing. We are all in a constant communication. And in my personal opinion, communication is indeed key because so many conflicts can be avoided if people talk to each other. Mm -hmm. And if you know how to talk to each other, it's even better. And this is kind of my mission with my YouTube channel and uh, with my, let's say, future career is to really um, help people um, talk more efficiently or listen more efficiently or just really um, make a progress in this topic of communication because in school we learn words we learn phrases, but unfortunately, at least not in my school, we never learned how to talk to someone, like mm -hmm. um, how to formulate your thoughts in such a way that it's not hurtful for someone. Mm -hmm. Or um, another topic that I, I am simply in love and I uh, also have videos on that is body language. And this is the next level. And it's mind blowing when you start to get into this topic how much information you can get from nonverbal communication. So when someone talks to you uh, and you know some keys and some um, things that, for example, if uh, the person has his or her head on the right or on the left, it means that and that, uh, you see and understand so much more. And you can see if the person lies, if the person is um, into this topic, if the person is bored, 
if, um, for example, if you're trying to sell something or you are, you are in a meeting, you can um, see automatically if this person is uh, willing to sign the contract with you or not. And if you know this That's during so cool. the conversation, and when you are aware of this, you don't wait till the end of the meeting to hear a yes or no. You will see during the meeting and you can adjust your communication in such a way that it's a, it's a, it's a yes in the end. So it's really something extremely interesting and extremely useful, as, especially in relationships. And I mean romantic relationships, but also um, relationships with friends or networking. Um, I cannot say that <laughs> I'm a super big expert in romantic relationships, but uh, what I realized from my own experience and from, from the experience of my friends is um, how important communication is in a relationship that a lot of us expect the other person to read our minds. Mm -hmm. And then we are mad because this person didn't do what we wanted him or her to do. Mm -hmm. And learning to communicate would make everything so much easier. I know I said this word a thousand times already, but this is really the way it is. It makes life more um, interesting. It's, mm, you can persuade your goals much better. If you want to do something, you have this little tools that can help you to achieve the answer that you want to hear or the outcome that you want to have. And um, you can do this by knowing how to formulate your thoughts, knowing how to say things, knowing when and how to not say some things, like um, have some breaks when you talk, knowing how to proactively move your body or look at someone in such a way that you transmit a nonverbal message. It's, um, it's really, the, the, um, I think the moment you start to get deeper into this topic, you see how mind-blowing it is. That's why I love your YouTube channel, because it's very informative and it's very helpful and it can apply to absolutely anyone. Because as you say, we all communicate in a way or another and they're really useful tips that you can apply in any situation be that mm -hmm. in a presentation or in, at, in the work environment, in your relationship with your friends, whatever. It's a super useful YouTube channel and well done for that. What I, um, I was, because you were saying some things and I kind of related to the podcast and the, I'll tell you in a second what I was thinking about. But I like that you said that you were looking at your first video that you did and you were thinking, oh, you know, the microphone wasn't there and this wasn't there. But it's kind of, um, as you're saying as well in the self-confidence um, episode, can I call yeah. it an episode? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Whatever, the latest uh, YouTube video that you did. And when you're saying that you don't have to wait for it to be but for something, something to be perfect to do it. You don't have to, yeah. because the, you, there is no such thing as perfection anyway. You just have to do it. Do what you like, do what you love, just do it. And then you look back and think, oh yeah, I could improve this or that or that. So I love that you talk about these things, but you also apply them, which is super important. And um, I love hearing you talking about it. What I was relating the YouTube, your YouTube channel with my podcast was one that before starting the post podcast, I kept having this idea for yeah. a while now, for more than a year. And I kept thinking about different concepts every time. And then I kept changing it until I actually started it during the pandemic as well, although I did have this <laughs> idea before. But um, be because now that we, you know, there are more people available as well that I could interview. So it, it kind of was the perfect time to just start it. And mm -hmm. I had the same as you say, you know, I started learning editing it myself and I started learning things that I can do. And every time I try to improve little things, but um, that's the thing. You just have to start it and then slowly, slowly grow, which um, is amazing. So talking about editing, because so I do it only the audio version, although I know there are some podcasters that do video as well. I do mm -hmm get into the video part because for me it's a total new level of complications um i'm interested to know how long it takes you to edit because it takes so much time to do all these technical bits 
uh, which some um, people don't realize. Um, how long does it take you to edit an episode, more or less? Um, I think it really depends on the format of the video because there are some people that are putting just the camera in front and they just talk and that's all. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's a good for, or a bad format. It's just it's easier from an editing point of view. Mm -hmm. Um, if you mm, watched attentively the videos that I produce, so to say, uh, there are a lot of cuts in between. There are, in, in, I mean, cuts not that, um, mm, there are a lot of cuts in the sense that I then zoom the camera, for example, uh, in my editing program. So it's uh, closer, far away. Um, there are a lot of elements, for example, some pictures. And what I didn't realize before um, starting this whole thing with YouTube is that the pictures that appear in videos and they, they are moving, um, they don't move from themselves. So you have to make them move and you have to do this in the program. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes you have to color correct the videos because sometimes it's... Um, more sun in the room than usual and so on so there's a, there are a lot of little things mm -hmm. but um i think the more elements i add the more i play with the angles and so on the more time it takes mm -hmm. but on an average it's always more than an hour let's put it like that yeah it's, and it's pretty long process and i know i know from what you're talking, because I get excited about editing the podcast and adding music yeah. and doing this. So this, this time, I know it takes a lot, a lot of time, but I know it's enjoyable as well, because um, I, I get the feeling that we, <laughs> we get the same <laughs> excitement when we yeah. do something. And um, that's, when, that, that's what happens when you actually do what you like. And um, before getting to editing, I'm interested to know how do you choose your next subject that you want to talk about and then because I imagine you do your own research but yeah. how, how do you choose a subject and do you do it after you get influenced by a certain book or a certain thing that you studied in university and then you do your proper your your own research after that how how does the process happen before you get to the filming part um, for me personally, this is the most difficult part because uh, I have many, many ideas and I have, I have them written everywhere. Like I have a notebook where I write them, I write them in my phone. So I have millions of ideas that I always um, um, note somewhere. Mm -hmm. But then when I sit and decide, okay, what should I film this week? Um, I kind of look at these ideas and it seems like, uh, are they really as good as I thought? Are they this? Um, okay, this topic is interesting, but is it interesting for everyone? What exactly can I say a bit about this topic? So usually um, selecting topics. Mm -hmm. um, it is rather difficult for me. So idea generation works good, but selecting them all and um thinking what exactly i can talk about it takes a little bit more time for me mm -hmm. but the mo but 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 uh, by the time i i know it or i decide on topic i go on youtube and i um, search for similar topics and i do my little research to see if there are many many videos about that or from very 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 big channels uh maybe i it's not the best idea for me to film this video right now because I cannot compete with them. Mm -hmm. um, so I can either cho choose another topic or um, I'll make a little bit, a little deviation from that. For example, the video from today with confidence, there are thousands of videos about confidence on, on YouTube, mm -hmm. but I um, kind of niched it down to communication. So not how, what, confident people think or what confident people wear, but what confident people don't say. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of niche down so that I can compete a little bit in this, in this, uh, on this, let's say market or on this platform, because it's huge. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, uh, but it's, it's interesting. And then when I choose the topic and I know, okay, it works pretty good. Uh, and uh, the tags, I have, for example, already some ideas for the title even before I film. 
and I also run them through YouTube. There are a couple of um, little extensions that you can either buy or they're free of charge that you can see how well are these tags performing. So oh, yeah, so it's, that's an interesting thing. Yeah, um, they're not 100% exact because there are many factors that enter into this, but you can basically see if there is, uh, if there are a lot, a lot, like if there are a lot of videos about it with this keyword or um, yeah, tag. And if there are a lot of videos from big channels and then it doesn't make sense for you to target it, mm -hmm. then you can search for something else. And again, use these tags in your title and so on. So it's, it's, a, lo it's a rather lo long process even before I sit down and film it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And do you, do you write a script? Do you write some ideas down? Because you talk in a very coherent, what's the word, coherent way. Um, you, you speak so well, um, but I imagine you have a plan of what you were going to talk about. And I'm wondering, do you just write some ideas down? Do you write the proper script? What happens before you actually start talking? And does, did it help you? Because you're telling me earlier, not in the podcast, that you, do, you did some uh, theater classes as well. Does it help you with um, your body language as well and expressivity in, in your words? Uh, to the first question, um, when I just started, I had some keywords in my mind or some bullet points, mm -hmm. but I didn't have a script. And then I realized that um, it took me very long to film because I would think while filming mm -hmm. what I'm going to say. So it took me a, a lot of time and I decided to optimize this and I started to write proper scripts, like write texts with my own words but a, a, um, a text <laughs> that I was basically, let's say, learning by heart the, four, the first, I don't know, five sentences and say it, and then look at the other five and learn them by heart and then say it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was faster to film, but then I realized that in some of the videos, although they were my words, it sounded a little bit robot, not robotic, but a little bit, I don't know, something was missing out. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that um, there is this uh, holy grail in public speaking that you should say, you, you should minimize your ams and mm and, uh, and so on. It's like the, the, it's the goal of all public speakers. Um, but what I realized, at least in my videos, is that these uh, little ams and mms um, they add a little bit more life mm -hmm. to my videos. Mm -hmm. And uh, right now what I do, I usually have some bullet points again. Yeah. I have an idea what I want to say, but I don't write a text. I have, for example, uh, let's say for the last video about uh, five things self-confident uh, people um, never say. I, I, I thought about these five things. I wrote them down, but I didn't really think before what I'm going to say. So it sounds more natural. It sounds yeah. more like me. Mm -hmm. And I think this is one of the goals of mine is that when people meet me in their realities, they don't feel this difference between me talking in front of a camera and me talking to a person mm -hmm. because I have the same style of talking everywhere. That's and I don't want to fake it. Yeah. I have the same uh, thing with my podcast. That's why I don't preset questions beforehand. Yeah. I do. I do my research about that particular person. Uh, I would, you know, I, I was listening to a lot of YouTube videos that you did, also because they're very useful, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but I would, I would do my research, but then let it sink in my head, and maybe have a very general idea of what I want to talk about. But yeah. it's always better to just have this feeling of a natural conversation because as, as you were saying as well, I want it to feel natural. This is how I am. This is how I talk. Uh, I like to make fun of things, you know, I like yeah. to laugh and I don't want it to be too serious. So, but also touch important things. So I, can, I kind of, um, I'm on the same level as you on that. I think um, it depends uh, on the format 
for example, there are videos on YouTube about almost the same topics as mine, but they're, for example, from um, some PhD, te like they're teachers or they have a PhD in communication. Mm -hmm. And then their tone is different. They are, they have this tone of professor. They have, a, they talk very clearly and they have a very clear structure and it's very, you know, university-like which mm -hmm. is also good for some kind of videos. But for me, because my personality is different, I wanted to translate my personality to my channel. And yes, it's informative. Yes, it's, it, it, it has a, a structure. I don't talk about everything in my, in my video, but um, I don't want it to, I don't, I want you to have this, you know, um, air, a, a little bit of air in it. So it's, easy to listen so that you don't feel like you're in a classroom and you're listening to a teacher but more of you have the feeling that you're talking to a friend who gives you a piece of advice or I don't know talks to you about something she learned mm -hmm. yeah exactly it it's up to as you're saying it's not that some you, you know some things are wrong or not wrong it's it's about the style of the person style of the, you know the tone that you want to give to your whatever mm -hmm. YouTube yeah. channel podcast or whatever and that also reminds me actually of uh, when you're talking about styles of learning as well because yeah. different people have different styles of learning and I thought that was such an important topic that you talked about because I for example remember when I was at university I realized at that point that I'm a visual person for me it's very important that everything that I learn or read I need to make it into a scheme with color codes mm -hmm. I need to write it down I need to see it I need to make it as graphic as possible so that I understand it and I can actually see it and if I had a four year a four um, hour course at university and it was a lot of talking I just couldn't concentrate and I couldn't learn anything so I just decided I remember I decided at that point that this is a waste of my time I'm staying yeah. sitting there not learning anything so for that particular course I just decided not to go and then just study by myself at home because um, the teacher would give us all the materials that we needed to, to study so I find it more efficient for myself yeah. to just go at home and see it and do you know drawings <laughs> on paper <laughs> and make sense like to see it and I find yeah. it such such an important subject that you raised because first of all and also I like the exercise that you gave to people to write in the comments yeah. I won't say anything or I shouldn't say <laughs> anything at all <laughs> because I'm ruining the purpose of this I'm gonna delete this part so that people no, watch no, it and... no it's fine no 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 okay. don't worry um <laughs> So, yeah, I, I find it so good, first of all, to identify what type you are and yeah. then to realize that it's okay that you can't. So I, I, I knew that in, that in that point in my head, I, I said to myself, it's okay that I don't go to this course because it's just a waste of my time and I can't learn it this way. And then I just decided I'm more efficient learning in a different way. So I think so many people don't know about it and maybe they get mm -hmm. frustrated and maybe they think they're worthless. Maybe they think they're not good enough. And yeah, just do you want to talk a little bit more about this? Uh, obviously, I'll put the link as well. But yeah, oh. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Go Thank ahead. You. Um, no, I think um, it's, uh, you're right. What, why, what, what I really like about um, the videos that I produce or the topics that I choose that is that people mm, see it from a different perspective that I had when I was filming it. And I think it's wonderful because then every single person takes the message the way he or she needs to take it. Mm -hmm. So you, when you watch the video, you thought of your professor and that uh, you thought that it was, it's a waste of time to learn the way he where she was teaching you and you would rather learn the way you like to learn mm -hmm. and I think it's it's a, an amazing interpretation uh, but uh, when I was filming it I was thinking about um, the other side so not the person that is learning but the person that is teaching mm -hmm. 
and mainly uh, about the future presenters. And I, when I say presenters, I mean both teachers, university teachers, school teachers. If you are um, presenting, if you're a salesperson and you present uh, an idea to a client or you are a public speaker, we all are presenters. And what I thought is that if you as a presenter realize and you are aware that there are different people who learn differently, then your key to success is to teach the way they learn the best, not the way you learn the best. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, there is also this um, example in my video um, that I had a teacher that was learning um, visually the best. And because she was learning this way, she was teaching this way. But there are students who are not like this. And uh, this is counterproductive for them, mm -hmm. as, as in your case, for example. So as a presenter, when you, for example, uh, you don't know who will be in your audience. So you are a public speaker. You don't know your audience. What is good is to implement all types of learning into your presentation in a way or another so that this message comes to or um, arrives or is received by everyone. Uh, if, for example, you are a teacher and let's say you know your kids or you know your students, you know more or less how they study, then you can on purpose implement those elements that you know that they will like so that they learn. Mm -hmm. Because I think the best teacher is the one that from whom you learn, you know, the best teacher doesn't, I don't know, teach the best. The best teacher is when you learn as a student the best. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it makes much sense, but that was the idea that as a presenter, you should be aware that not everyone is like you and not everyone learns the way you learn. Mm -hmm. So if you want to um, reach a higher audience or if you want to you want your message to be understood by the majority of the people or all people then you should implement both pictures and sounds or some exercises or uh, there are many techniques that you can implement mm -hmm. it's really cool to see that um, probably each person that listens to you filters through their own experiences and gets yeah what they need to get from that, you know, that's, video. That, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I'm going to go back to, because it's, it's my style of asking questions is very chaotic. <laughs> and I ask oh, uh, probably too many questions <laughs> at one time. I, I wanted to go back to, the, to ask you if you think that studying theater when you were, um, was it when you were in school? Did, did that, uh, yeah. do, you think, do you think this helps you as well? I think that, uh, first of all, when you do theater classes, and I did theater classes, and I was in a theater course, so to say, in one of the theaters in Kishinev. Mm -hmm. um, and what, right, at the beginning, it helped me just to um, get more confident in front of other people. Mm -hmm. Because you're in a group of kids, and if you're in a theater class um, or theater course, maybe some kids were sent there by the pen parents, but the majority, they are there because they like it. And um, you kind of learn to not be so frozen, let's say, on the stage. You feel more confident, more comfortable. And um, as for me, um, I was also dancing. Uh, I was part of a um, folk folks dance um, club in, in um, Kishino for 10 years wow. uh, and yeah and uh, what theater and dancing taught me is to get to have more control over my body um, and second of all to express my ideas also through my body language and I, I'm sure you saw it in my videos. If uh, you didn't watch my video yet, you should go and check it out. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <wait. laughs> Yes. Um, you see that I, for example, I know that I use a lot of hands when I talk. And um, yes. I don't Do you know I what? Sorry to interrupt. I'm, I just get too excited when you say something. And I am so bad at interrupting. I interrupt all my guests and, and I know it's, it's bad. Fine. But it's fine. <laughs> I just want to say, I really noticed when you introduce yourself 
and you just do this thing with your hands and then you just yeah. point at yourself. I find this yeah. cool because it's so it kind of it's a thing that I already associate with you when you say hello. I'm Luminita <laughs> and then you do those nice hands. Oop, oop. I'm here. Oop. I love it. Um yeah, but this is, I don't say that everyone should do that, but I think um if you watch a professor or a public speaker you are much more into the topic when you see this person moving. It doesn't have to be chaotic or running on the stage or running in front of the class. But if you're staying there as a statue frozen on your chair, uh, nobody will listen. Mm -hmm. Although you can, you can um, have the most interesting topic in the world. Nobody will listen because people need a little bit of a dynamic. And what theater classes and dancing... Uh, teaches really to learn your body, get a little bit of a control over it, learn a little bit of plasticity. Um, and when, for example, um, I don't know, did you watch my TED, TEDx talk? No. Um, I didn't know you have a TEDx talk. Uh, <laughs> oh my um, God. I, I need to I watch it though. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's super interesting. So yeah, I'm, I'm a TEDx uh, speaker. And um, uh, during my speech, I was, um, you know, all my moves were intentional. So I knew where I want people to look. And the movements were, because I'm already comfortable in that, my movements were in natural. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, again, this is my style. I want people to feel as if they are, they're not listening to a professor, but they're listening to someone they know. And um, yeah, I think theater classes and dancing classes, they help you to get to know yourself better, get to know um, how you feel more comfortable, how you sit more comfortable, how it's more natural to you. And when you know that, you can, um, first of all, feel more comfortable and confident on the stage or in front of other people, but also it helps you, um, yeah, move more nicely or stay more nicely on the stage or even it's not it's, if it's not on the stage even if you're walking on the street you have a different posture for example mm -hmm. and so on do you practice in front of a mirror to see how all these moving movements will go during a presentation i know about this technique i tried it out and i hate it but it's my it's my experience yeah, because yeah. i when i when i um okay so for me when I talk in front of a real public, I, I love uh, this contact with the audience. So I look into their eyes and I get a lot of information from them if it's boring or too fast and so on. Now, uh, when I'm practicing in front of the mirror, I, <laughs> it's super weird because I start to search for clues in my eyes mm -hmm. or in my hands. And then it's weird for me. So when I have a big presentation, for example, for the TEDx, I was filming myself and then I was watching these videos, but I, uh, I don't know. Now I can watch my videos on YouTube, but for, for the TEDx, when I was preparing it, I could not watch myself like from the beginning till the end because it was weird to see myself mm -hmm. uh, in, on, on, uh, like as a video. But uh, it really helps to film yourself and then watch them because if you're doing this in a mirror you are aware of your movements and when you just film yourself you don't i mean maybe at the beginning you think of it but with the time you don't think about your movements anymore so when you watch the video you realize what you do so you see okay there uh my hands were too much there my legs were not moving at all and so on so as for me, it looks better if I feel myself rather than the mirror. This is such a complex thing because I imagine a lot of people, I know you were talking about the fear of public speaking as being the, in top fears for humans. Yeah. Um, so I think for, for so many people, it's already nerve wracking to be on stage and talking and they're probably just thinking about what they're going to say, the actual words. But it's yeah. such a complex thing that you do everything deliberate, the movements, you yeah. look into people's eyes. I imagine that it's actually a very complex thing because you do all these things while also sending your message. 
And it's just mind blowing to hear all these things that <laughs> you have to think about all this. So I, I just um, searched for your TEDx talk. Obviously, I'm not going to listen to it now, but uh, it's <laughs> three major reasons why love sucks. Is that yes? It? <laughs> and also how to become a TEDx speaker. Yeah, yeah, right. but that was on my channel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to listen to this definitely and i'll put the link as well but you know to, to yeah. what you said right now when when you talk to your friends mm-hmm. are you really thinking uh, like do, do you really think so much about how you move your hands or how to look and so on no <laughs> definitely not. exactly You're just and being this natural. is the goal yes yeah. and this is the goal on the stage i mean you have to practice but this is the goal, to talk on the stage as if in front of you are your friends or some people that you know. And when you achieve this goal, like when you practice, practice, practice and achieve this goal, you'll see that from that point on, of course, you're a little bit nervous before. Even I am nervous. It's n- normal. Mm-hmm. But um, when you're on the stage, you don't think anymore of, oh, my God, how are my hands? Oh, my God, everyone is looking at my head that is to left than it should be or something like that mm-hmm. you, I, that's why I think it's important to learn yourself and your body better because then you are aware of what you're doing and then you don't think about it, it anymore you're just there this is super cool <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering also during these videos do you find that they are kind of a self-help as well for you do you find because you also you talk about things that you already know you do some of your research as well but do you like i'm gonna try and explain it with an example um for example what should i say i I can't actually think about the video that you have done but I don't know if you, you, you understand what I'm trying to explain yeah. because usually I, I, my questions. Mm-hmm. That, so yeah, do you, when you find you do a video, do you find that you're learning something new as well? And you're trying to apply while also teaching this, this thing to other people. Is it a self-help as well? Um, I, that's what I said a little bit earlier that I, I wanted really my channel to get my personality in, certain, in a way or another. Mm-hmm. And, um, I think what is, I would say unique, but let's call it unique because I cannot think of a different uh, um, um, word, is that on my channel, and I don't hide it, I'm not an expert, like I don't have three PhDs in communication. Mm -hmm. Um, On my channel, I, let's say, teach what I learn. So I learn something in communication and public speaking. I think it's interesting. And then I tell others about it. Mm -hmm. So there are many topics on my channel that I was aware of a little bit, but then I started to learn more about it. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. And I, then I started, and then I decided to make um, a video about it. Mm -hmm. So I really learn with my channel. So I grow with my channel as well, but you're right. I think um, it's a little bit of a self help as well, because Well, I teach, let's say, uh, um, about public speaking, about communication. So imagine if I give you some pieces of advice, but I do none of them. Would you listen to me? No, because it's, it's, there is um, um, cognitive dissonance. Like, why is she telling us the whole time that we should avoid the word, let's say that, but then she that say that this word that every single that (laughs) time. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I think that it's, it's, and I learn from my videos as well. For example, um, I have a video about Pachacucha, the third video, and I was preparing for this video. I was rewatching my other two ones mm-hmm. to remind myself about something. Mm-hmm. And uh, so my videos are, uh, even I learned, like I rewatch them. Of course, for example, if I filmed the video three months ago, now I know more or now I'm on a different stage of my life, whatever. And when I rewatch them, I see something new, I learn something new. So yeah, yeah I think it's kind of a self-help as well. 
makes perfect sense. Um, I also wanted to say that I really like that you are always uh, investing in learning and you know, especially lately you've been talking about how you're taking all sorts of courses and mm -hmm. reading all these books. So that's uh, an amazing thing to promote in general because I don't know, like I find, I found it a little bit weird when the pandemic started that some people, only some, were saying that they get bored. And I'm thinking, how can you get bored when suddenly <laughs> during the pandemic, a lot of there are a lot of free courses as well because yeah. different companies decided, well, all these people have a lot of time. Let's give, give them some free courses. So not only you, like there were some free courses, but people didn't even think to take them, but you also bought your courses because you have this extra yeah. motivation. I want to learn. I want to learn. I want to learn. So I really love this thing. And I really think that needs to be pr promoted, that you need to always learn something and search for something and, you know, get to have more interests yeah. in general. Yeah, and I think it's, um, I, I posted a Insta story yesterday that I'm uh, um, hungry for knowledge. Yeah, and, I like that one. And, I, and uh, or some people say thirsty for knowledge. Um, and I realized that, um, okay, I always complain about my university, <laughs> uh, not because it's bad, but because uh, I uh, don't really like the, all the teaching styles that are there. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when I complain about my university um, or the courses, some courses that I have there, um, some people that don't know me good, they, uh, they get this impression that I don't like learning mm -hmm. or that, yeah, but you should learn they tell me you, yeah but you should learn and then what i realized is that um i when i have to write an essay for a course that i have zero interest in i leave it for the last moment and i check and i write it in such a way that it's done because it has to be done mm -hmm. but when i find a topic that is interesting for me i not only learn everything but i search for extra information mm -hmm. and uh, I think it's something that a lot of people I, I heard people telling me that oh I guess learning is that for me like oh I'm you know I, I don't think I'm the knowledge type and I think that's wrong we all are made for learning and we're all knowledge type you just have to find something that is interesting for you specifically mm -hmm. for example I I'm, I'm super lucky that I found out that I like to learn about communication so I really invest time and let's say also money in books and courses and I enjoy it. I don't start a course with the thought, oh, I have to do it. But, mm -hmm. oh, yes, I can, I can finally start something. I, I can finally learn something new. And uh, I know a lot of people that were telling me that, oh, I think I'm, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not made for it, studying. No, you are made, but you have to find what you really like. And then you will see that you'll really, I don't know, go to sleep late at night just because you wanted to finish that book or you wake up in the morning earlier because you want to read that book or watch that course before you go to university or work mm -hmm. and so on. That's amazing. And talking about uh, things that you uh, like and get excited about, I want to talk about um, <laughs> Ariel Silk. Is that how you call it? Yeah, yeah. Because I never heard about it until you told me about it, and it's amazing. Do you want to tell us a little about a little bit about it? Yeah, sure. Um, as I told you, when I was living in Moldova, I was dancing. So I was basically dancing my whole life, even before I got to that folk dance club. I I was dancing my whole life, and um, I think that um, also because. I don't, I'm not sure if um, all of you know, but if you're curious, uh, you can watch on YouTube some folk dances like Moldavian or Russian or Belarusian, and you will see how much movement there is and how much force that is. So when you're dancing, you, it's really all kinds of training. It's cardio training, it's uh, <laughs> weight training, it's everything. And it's stretching and so on. And I loved it. Uh, when I moved to Austria, I... Um, <laughs> Um, oh, I'm so, uh, I'm always uh, a little bit um, hesitant to say it, 
uh, mm, because I feel ashamed for myself, I gained 10 kilograms uh, um, in, I guess, three months or four months. And uh, it's not much. Um, generally, it's not much. But for a girl that was used to be always super fit, to get super unfit, for me personally, it's not about body shaming or anyone. It was about me and my body and my vision of myself. I felt bad. Mm-hmm. Um, and I started to search for some sources of or some kinds of sports that I can do mm-hmm. so that I get back, back in shape. Um, and um, I tried some dancing classes in Innsbruck, but I, don't, I didn't really like them. And then I tried um, um, like going to the gym. And uh, I think it's nothing new that we take uh, some, um, we pay for the gym, but we don't go there. <laughs> um, and actually, this is, if, I don't know if you knew that, but this is how the gym business is uh, built on people that are paying, but not going there. Really? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, I was in a constant search and, for example, for, with the gym, I could go there two days or three days. I was super motivated, but then I would find excuses to not go there because I didn't feel like. And um, I find I it a bit boring some... as well. Yeah, I'm interrupting again. <laughs> no, no, no worry. <laughs> but um, I thought it was boring as well. But there are, but you know, the thing is, when I was going to the gym, I could see people that are so into them, mm-hmm. and they are really searching for information on how to do more exercises with this uh, training, I don't know, uh, equipment, and they were searching more about nutrition. So there were so many people into it. And I was, let's say, bored. And I was so confused because how come? (laughs) And and I... and Did you try classes? Did you try classes? I did like the classes, but I did not like going to those machines. They were so boring. <laughs> yes, but uh, at the gym that I was going, the all the classes that I liked that were uh, during the day and also the university. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in the evening, there were either no classes or some classes that um, I was not sure I want to go. <laughs> mm-hmm. And um, I don't know. It was just at some point I started to think same as with the learning, maybe sports are not for me. <laughs> mm-hmm. But then I was thinking, then I remember like, come on, you were doing dancing for so long. It cannot yeah. be not for you. Mm-hmm. And uh, in all my search, I, um, I found out about, um, a, let's say it's not really a gym. It's a center. Uh, it's actually for pole dance. Mm-hmm. And uh, I saw um, a different talent shows, girls and guys on poles, and I realized that it's pretty interesting. Mm-hmm. So I saw that, and I was like, okay, I want to try it out. But then um, the the beginners course started a week before I saw it, and uh, I thought, okay, mm, I'm too late. Um, I cannot go for it. But I had this feeling that I want to start now. I don't want to wait for two months mm-hmm. more. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes you just get this feeling that either you do it now or you will not do it at all. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I remember uh, when we were in India, we were at one climbing gym and over there, they had uh, a big sill, like some big, big silks in the middle of the gym. And there were two girls practicing there. And I thought it was so elegant. Mm-hmm. And then when I was rec- and I saw that the pole course was uh, started already, I also saw that they have some aerial silks classes as well. And there were like drop-ins. So you could go there with any level. They like, you could be a beginner or a professional, doesn't matter, you could just go there. Mm-hmm. And I thought it was interesting. And I signed up for one and I went there and, um, the first class was, um, let's say, a little bit horrible for me because I was, okay, I got back in shape a little bit, but not so well. And uh, because of the um, dancing, my legs are strong, but my uh, upper body is not. Mm-hmm. And in silks, you have to have a strong upper body because you pull yourself almost all the time. And I realized that, oh, this is such a big challenge for me, mm-hmm. but I enjoy it. 
it's a lot of strength it's a lot of flexibility it's a lot of stretching it's elegant yet strong and i liked it so much so i decided to give it two more chances and after the third time i was so into it and now um when i uh, have for example um aerial silks class and i don't know i'm not in the mood today i don't find excuses to not go there i just know that okay today i don't i don't i'm not in the biggest mood or in the best mood but I want to go there. So I go there and then my mood go like boost and I'm super happy. Um, and I think uh, after really searching, I found one of many sports, I guess, that I really, really enjoy. And mm -hmm. I, it's the same as with learning. You have, it's not, you have to find something that motivates you and something that you like. Because again, with the gym, it's something super interesting for many people it was not interesting for me. That's why I was not going there. With yeah. Ariel, I, I am interested in it. That's why I'm, if I, for example, there are sometimes classes without a teacher, you just can go there and practice. And if I see that online, I book it straight away because I want to go there. I want to practice. I want to be better in that. And not for a competition or something. It was just, it's interesting for me. Mm -hmm. And I really think that people that don't do sports, but they want to, they just have to try different sport arts or different sport types out and then when they find that one that make their I don't know uh hard to scream and th that sport type that they really enjoy they will not find excuses to not go there because they want to go there yeah yeah I know what you mean I tried a lot of sports especially I wasn't at all a sporty person before going to university and then I tried going to the gym. I tried all the classes at the gym. I tried running. I tried everything that I could try. And I just like started exclu excluding the ones that I don't enjoy at all. Yeah. So, for example, I really dislike running. <laughs> and I don't <laughs> do too. it. I don't do it. Exactly. Yeah. So it's, it's funny as well because me and my partner, we're, we have opposite types of sports. He really loves intense cycling, running, and I actually like Pilates, yoga, yeah. dancing. <laughs> so <laughs> the thing that we do in common, that's hiking. So we both love that. So we found something that we can both enjoy. But otherwise, he can just go and do his own cycling. I'll just do something else. And I do like sports in general, but I found by trying different ones, I found the ones that work for me and I do yeah. the exercises that I like. And that ma keeps me motivated to keep doing it. Otherwise, I'll be like, oh, I need to run again. I don't want to run. Yeah. <laughs> but what's the point? You can do a high intensity workout as well by dancing, just jumping around and dancing and whatever. You can wait, yeah. do the same kind of level of, you know, maybe not the same, but at least you're getting fit by doing something enjoyable as well. And you're having nice exactly. music and you're just, you know, you know what I mean. But yeah. it was super interesting to find about this um, aerial seal because I never heard about it before. I have a friend that is an experienced uh, pole uh, instructor and she mm -hmm. did ballet as well. And she's yeah. doing ballet with pole dancing oh, and that that's should be so, beautiful. so beautiful exactly and then i saw the video that you showed me what you're doing and i found it wow next level <laughs> so cool it's so yeah i, I already imagined that you should you should be very strong i mean you build your strength obviously yeah it requires yeah. strength flexibility but it's also so elegant and yes as I was telling you in messages before, I just find freedom in this kind of sport. I don't know why. I find it like you're free in the air. Yeah. It's just so beautiful. You are basically in the air. You're not on the floor. You are yeah. somewhere up. Yeah. It's so beautiful. Do you have any other interests or hobbies that you want to talk about today? Um, I, I imagine have... you have a lot. <laughs> That's why I was thinking the ones that you want to talk about or you have time because we've been talking for two hours and it just didn't feel like the time is flying. So I imagine we I have to wrap up. Sorry? I love these discussions that oh. are going for hours, but you don't feel as if you have to search for a topic. It just comes naturally like, oh, by yeah. the way, oh, by the way. Yeah, me too. <laughs> but I don't know, because I, 
I'm uh, learning about you today more and more. <laughs> so maybe there's something you want to talk about that I can't ask because I don't know. Uh, I don't know either. <laughs> <laughs> you don't the know. thing is, I'm, I, I'm a very curious person. So I, I have many interests. Some are bigger, some are smaller. But my mom used to tell me that um, when I was small, I was so, I had a lot of energy. So I was that kid that would not sit on, a, would not sit generally. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, I think out of there, I realized that I want to put my energy and I have to spend my energy some, some, somewhere. And um, that's why I have a lot of interest. Like you, a lot of them. <laughs> um, that's like, I don't know. If you ask me something, I can tell you, oh yeah, by the way. But just <laughs> like this, I cannot think. Yeah, of yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know what you mean. I mean, I think it's a great quality to be curious. Yeah. Um, I, th- I think that's so important to just love life by being curious. Otherwise, what's the point? <laughs> um, do you love nature? I imagine you do. But you talked about nature as well. Uh, what shall I ask you? I think, I think we covered quite a lot. I'm sure at some point we'll, we'll get to do another episode with yeah, you. I'm very glad if you, if you invite me. I'm, I'm always glad to, to, be, to talk to you. Oh, that's so sweet. I really enjoy talking to you and um, I feel your excitement. I feel <laughs> your passion for everything you do and keep being like that. Keep being curious and loving what you do and sharing knowledge. That's so good as well because, you know, there are some people that they just want to learn it for themselves and keep it for themselves. But you <laughs> are so generous with your knowledge and I wish you all the best with your um, studies and with everything you do. And I hope I'll see you in person one day. I hope so too. Thank you very, very much for inviting and having me here. It was really a big pleasure. Oh, for me too. For me too. (laughs) And I hope uh, the people that will listen to this will um, learn something new today.